strength if everyone would rise to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> I'll let the record show the gang is all here. <laughs> Yay. All right, we need an adoption of the agenda, including the supplemental personnel report, which we have an updated um, personnel in the um, green folder. I make that motion. All right. A second. Motion by Pamela and a second by Tammy. All in favor? 7-0. And Tracy, did you have a chance to look over the bills? I did, and everything appeared in order. Great. I'd like to make a motion. Okay. For the bills. All right. I'll second it. Motion by Tracy and a second by Jeff. All in favor? 7 0. Uh, now we have um, a special presentation for Kathy Conradi. Uh, the Kansans can serve it safe. Uh, it has presented her with an award for 2018-19 for best practice awards. Um, it says food safety is a high priority in our school district's cafeterias and the staff is well trained in safety procedures. New hires take the food safety basics class within the first month, then take the food safety and sanitation class within the first year. The food safety and sanitation class is renewed every three years. So Kathy, if you could come up. Get your picture taken. Very good. <clears throat> Does this mean we get to celebrate with cupcakes? <laughs> <laughs> well, I He's got jokes. <clears throat> I didn't used to move, and then I was in a few pictures. I just want to say publicly I'm very proud of the job that is done, the <coughs> leadership that continues to be done. It's a large responsibility, and you handle that every day. And I appreciate it. Thank you. I have a great staff. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you. All right, now we are ready for the Stucco reports. We have uh, Alexis Martinez Alba from Dodge City High School. So, hi, my name is Alexis Martinez and I'm presenting on behalf of the DCHS Student Council. So, so far, um, the football team is 6 0. This Friday, they will be Woo! competing against Garden for the Hatchet. Uh -huh. So, that means that this week is Hatchet Week. Uh, right now, we have a canned food drive against Hatchet for the Can Hatchet. Um, it's something new that we're doing this year that we're hoping will become a tradition as well. Um, two weeks ago, we attended the regional conference in Garden. Uh, there was a speaker, and then we did a number of activities <coughs> that helped us learn more about team building. We have our first informational meeting for Floor Show on October 22nd, and tickets should be available sometime early October, early November. Once we figure that out, we'll, we'll let everyone know. Uh, and lastly, we have some cool ideas cool ideas and potential leadership opportunities coming up that student council committees are beginning to plan. So thank you. Thanks, Alexa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, right. I would like to just throw in along with that, uh, I've been invited. We actually tried to do this last year and it didn't work out because of a situation that came up. But uh, the superintendent at Garden City has invited my wife and I to supper before the game in Garden City. So kind of a nice. sportsmanship effort. and. Uh, Looking forward to that. So I saw on the press release that Mr. Gifford passed out that they used to have a dance that both schools went to. I don't know how that would work. That wow. Was long. <laughs> yeah. Was long. 1903. <laughs> We're going to start with supper. I'll tell you. Okay. That. Dancing and all. You're volunteering to be a chaperone. Is that right, Dr. Dirksen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, next up we have uh, from Comanche Middle School, Arias, did I say that right? Arias. 
Area Sarmenta. I will get that before the end of the year for sure. <laughs> um, good evening. I'm Area Sarmenta, the 2019-2020 Stuco President for Comanche. Tonight I'm giving you guys an update on everything so far going on in Comanche. Starting off with academics. I said last meeting that we have a new impact period. So far that's going really good. In the hallways, all you hear is everyone saying how much they like the book we're reading. Social emotional lessons are going good. Everyone's like been explaining their feelings and the teachers really like that they're, we're being able to talk to them. Sports, um, football is doing really good. We have a game this Friday against DCMS, which means we're doing Spirit Week. Um, this week, our themes are Disney Day, Meme Day, Tie-Dye Day, and School Spirit Day. Today was Disney Day. Um, okay. Also, Lyft, we, our <coughs> teachers and principals elected like some students to be a part of a leadership program where we got to go to the Civic Center and get together with the speaker, and we got to learn proper ways to introduce ourselves and just how to be more of a leader. Other than that, Comanche is going really good. We are also working on fixing our problems with vaping. Unfortunately, it came up again. And so our lift group is working on finding ways to stop it, as well as bullying. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. I really like that the students are working on solutions on that. That's yeah. awesome. Good job, Arias. Thank, Thank you. you. And Mrs. Wells, do we have a DCMS? Okay. That that's a no. Okay. All right. Thank you. So we will find out double information from Dodge City Middle School next time. <laughs> All right. We have recognition of visitors. Persons may present ideas or concerns regarding USD 443 schools. No action will be taken by the board at this meeting. Personalities and behavior of employees are not to be presented during this period but are to be reported to the employee's immediate supervisor. The president shall determine the amount of time to be spent for citizen participation. If you'd like to address the board, please approach the podium at this time. All right, seeing nobody jump up, we'll move right ahead. Next up, we have the consent agenda, which includes <coughs> the approval of personnel, including the supplemental personnel report, Approval of minutes from the September 23rd Board of Education meeting. Approval of parental application for waiver of instructional materials fees. We've got information on that in our green folder. Approval of donation to Dodge City High School Band from the August Wolf Memorial. Approval of donation from Rob Sowers State Farm Agency for the Dodge City High School basketball program. Um, please make note in the minutes that that is not just boys, but it is boys and girls basketball. Um, approval of donation from Friends of Buffalo Dunes for the Dodge City High School women's golf program. That, approval. That, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. What? That's terrific. But Buffalo Dunes. Yeah. They did it last year, didn't they? Uh huh. Cool. Very, I just missed it the last eight. Yeah, I think we're right. <laughs> you got it this time. Even if you did leave your keys in your car. Because my is Approval of donation from family practice for Dodge City High School HOSA Club. What does that stand for? Head Start Program Instruction ACF dash PI dash dash HS dash 1901 for bright beginnings heads that's information only head start information memorandum memorandum notice of proposed rulemaking on designation renewal system changes public comment period um, a bunch of letters again for bright beginnings instructional information or information only and then the head start information memorandum uh, ACF IMHS 1903, Head Start and Early Head Start elig Eligibility for Children in Kinship Care, also for Bright Beginnings. I on make the a basketball, motion. you were clear about the boys and girls on the basketball? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, okay. 
And I just wanted to add on the uh, Head Start portion that those are federal requirements that we have to make sure that we have presented to the board, and it's very important that they be identified. So uh, consent agenda is a perfect place to do that, but I just want to make sure everybody understands the importance of that. So. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I make a motion for approval of the consent agenda. Okay. Second. We have a motion by Tammy and a second by Tracy. All in favor? 7-0. All right, we're ready for new business. Curriculum and instruction is first up. Good evening, board members, board president, Mr. Superintendent. On page 26, we'll um, update you on the fast bridge system that we had you approved earlier in the year. As you know, Asbridge was a screener that was identified that will help us identify instructional needs for students. If you look under current consideration, there's three paragraphs. Uh, I'll introduce it, but Dr. Springston will elaborate on things a little bit more. Uh, the things I want to point out are high risk, some risk, low risk, and college college and career ready, a career pathway. I'd like to focus that in on our CAP scores one, two, three, and four. K4 being the highest and low being, uh, and one being the lowest. And we'll show some graphs here. I think it's also important to point out that there was a meeting held, and again, Dr. Dirk, uh, Dr. Springston will talk more about the data and how to use it with the staff that uh, from each building was there. And I want to point out the next uh, window is December 10th to December 20th. The first window was September 3 to September 20th. But we also, every day, in fact, I got some today, when new students come in the district, we put them in the system so teachers can get their data as well. So we're just not leaving that window as it is. We'll, any new students come in, have a chance and then they're part of the program as well. So let's take a look at some of this data. The first slide there is as, as you were told before or as we're going to point out, A reading and A math were the two primary programs that were implemented in the district as a start. The system has a lot more, but that's the beginning. So if you look at the chart up there on the screen, you see grades two, three, four, five, six at the bottom. And if you look at grade 12, there might not be many students there. I don't know how many students. We didn't want to worry about that this time. But if you look at the yellow, that means the high risk students. And then the green, some risk, and the blue, low risk, and then of course the college and career. If you remember our CAP presentation that we did a few weeks ago, uh, you can see it's kind of about the same. So we've got some data to go with. If you look at the second chart, it's the AMAT, same, same thing, yellow high risk and so on. <clears throat> and if you look at your consideration sheet, you can see how these are then categorized in tier one, tier two, tier three. And the last chart is just a lower kindergarten and one as you can see, that data is missing from the first two charts. That's a different kind of assessment. And there's the data and how, how that looks like. So if there's no further questions on that part, Dr. Springston will go into detail on how all that comes together with the plane. I do want to make one quick note. The, the fast bridge, we're aligning it from um, up till 10th grade. And so if there, if you saw some, some data up there in 11th and 12th graders, it was because if there was a small number of students, we really wanted to get that. It was primarily an IP data collection. That's why I think those numbers um, seem elevated um, uh, for the high school numbers. But really what we wanted to show you, and, and I think what Ray did point out, is the way that it, this data is going to come to us, we can safely use this as a predictive. And the main purpose of this, this tool is not so much um, the data it, itself, but what we do with it. So it's between the, the testing windows. It's a screener for that purpose. And so what, we, what we've done over since the September window up until, well, presently, 
all of our buildings have been going through these data reports and meeting both as a, a whole building faculty, but then also in their professional learning communities to start by grade level or content area to dig down into this data and say, how did this align with shoring up our tier one? So tier one would be what all students should receive at grade level English language arts, for example. And then from that, what students need additional supports to support tier one, so that'd be our tier two, and if they need additional beyond that, tier three. So a lot of the comments that I've heard and what I want you guys to understand is it's been a pretty seamless transition with this, the, the actual software and, and the implementation. And I, I attribute that to the staff and we had two full days of training with our principals and our coaches to go over this and, and very purposely through consensus, we decided that there are a lot more screeners and diagnostic measurements that we could we will eventually add. We wanted to be very purposeful and roll out at the very beginning the A reading, A math, which is a quick screen, say where the kids are when they walk in and meet us. And we will get into in the December period where we go deeper. So if a student uh, is identified in A reading at high risk, we will give them a CBM or a diagnostic that will actually pinpoint what specific skill deficits do they have. And all of this is to be used for the planning. Most important thing with this tool is what we do with the data. So it's how we take that data and drive our instruction and really customize it and individualize it for all students. So if we got kids that are scoring at that college proficiency level, we need to understand that and how we group them in tier two supports to help enrich them as well. So when we think of this, we wanna think of enriching all of our students. Um, a lot of the comments that I've received from the buildings overall and in, in is, you know, in some cases, um, I'll use for example, the high school, they had quite a few students that were um, scoring, I believe, and I don't want to have to look at Jackie too to help add to this, but I think there was a little bit of shock at how high their students in aggregate were scoring, it, which is a good thing. It gives us a starting point. But, but I want to take a step back from that. What we want to do is not guess. We don't want to guess where our students are or where they're going to be. So when we take these screeners, we know exactly what they're, where they are right now, and then we set that very purposeful instruction around meeting their needs, and then we'll do another um, assessment in December to, to monitor progress. This whole purpose of this device, as we're telling our teachers, is not a measurement on them, it's a measurement on our system and how well we're serving our kids. So we wanna make sure that we're continually using data to drive decisions. We will add more of these diagnostics as we get into December, and part of that um, reason we wanna go slow is so we get good at the foundation, we train our teachers to be able to implement, and then how to decipher this, these tools and use it within their instructional plan. So, you know, I, we've, we know that we want to, what we want to do, and I know I've shared with the board, is we want to make sure that we know where our kids are, we're not guessing, and that we raise our expectations. And as I've gone around over the last several weeks in PLCs, um, I've heard a difference in the conversations we're having amongst teachers uh, from a year ago. Um, people talking about data and like the fact that there's some data set district-wide that they can see where kids are coming from um, they can have data then that can drill down and specifically help drive their instruction. So we're starting to hear them talk about where their kids are in the instructional practices, both in their classroom and then in the tier two and the other support. So not that that wasn't occurring last year, I'm just hearing it with much more frequency and much more focus um, right now through one screening. So I'm excited and I'm very confident that what we'll see is we'll see a lot of transformation in our instructional practice throughout this year and going forward because it's data driven. Um, I know that teachers are sharing this information with students. One of the concerns we have at high school level is when they take state assessments, we can see our numbers elevated and things like this beyond, above what the state assessments are. So bringing our kids in early saying, here's where you performed on this screener. It's indicative of where you are, but not where you're gonna be. And we predict if you go on this path, this is what you'll be able to do on the state assessment. So getting our kids to understand they're part of that journey, they're the most important piece, but then also get them engaged into leading up to that state assessment to have more investment in it. And so, I mean, a lot of, I mean, I, I think the most important thing is we're making data-driven decisions. Uh, and so I commend the staff as a whole, and we're very early in this, uh, but across the board, I'm hearing very um, positive um, responses to this, and, and we know that we're gonna continue to, to add and then also uh, trainer staff as, as we go along. So this is one data piece. Um, we're gonna have multiple data sets uh, as we'll add those um, over, the net, over the years, but this is a very important piece for us to be able to target where our kids are currently. So what questions might you have? Yeah. 
are, are parents um, given this information? We're working on a parent letter right now. I'm, so they'll know where their child mm -hmm. And part of it is right in, in the spring reports will be different because we'll have much more depth. And so we are working on a letter right now. I sent it out to the coaches Friday to look at it. Uh, I got some input from the KSD TASN um, folks also to kind of help what do we push out and how. Because we want to be very specific on when we sit down with a parent and say, here's the Lexile reading level of your child, here's grade level. But more importantly, here's our plan to move them up. Right. And so um, that is being scribed, and we should have it out to the principals. My intention is tomorrow. I think you say the next testing window is in December. Yes. Um, how, how do you, what's you, your data, let's say it's not where you want it to be. Okay, how, how do you shift in three months to get that get these children to where they need to be? I mean, what kind of mid-course correction or, or, or whatever you do? I mean, I, it's just interesting to me because, you know, you have a, a planned curriculum and then the data tells you something, then you've got another three months. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to test again. So right. what's, what's the plan well, in that event? No, I'm glad you asked because uh, I'll take, I'll, I'll go back. I know you guys have heard this. For example, the tiered intervention systems, the supports that we worked on last year. We know we got to have the foundation and the background um, to be able to build in the time for our teachers, one, to collaborate, but then two, to also um, set up within their schedule re uh, students receiving grade level content. That's one of the things that we discovered throughout last year's investigation and digging in collectively with DLT is we weren't exposing our students to grade level content. So we were lowering it to whatever their level was and so we weren't raising that expectation. We, they, they weren't being exposed to the content or the, the vocabulary that would be on the state assessment. That's one big change that we made. Um, the second piece, as you know, our focus on what we do with our coaches as far as how we're helping to support teachers in learning and implementing and modeling um, and providing feedback on best instructional practice. Our LINK grant is very focused on what are the, what are the reading strategies and the, um, the research behind that, and so that's another piece of it. Uh, I mean, everything that we're putting into place are the structural components. When we talked about um, we're very good at being, and we want to move towards a school system and not a system of schools. And I know I've said that before, but what we've found is we have a lot of independent practice between buildings and even within a building. And so what we're seeing is our teachers are doing the best job they can, but it's very fragmented. So we shored up a lot of what we're doing, removed things that didn't align or weren't research-based, and said this is going to be our guaranteed curriculum and the materials and support materials that we're going to use to teach our kids. So we're shoring all that up. So we could remove peripheral things that won't move us towards target. Well, I know we've talked a lot about but so much of this last year has been structure, and we're still in that. I mean, when we talk about ELA Tier 1 is what we talked mostly last year and is embedded now, is saying what do our kids have to be able to be exposed to and show and demonstrate at grade level? And if they can't, what are we putting into place? We've had many of our schools set up times within their buildings for those tiered interventions, so guaranteeing that they're going to have so many minutes of English language arts at grade level and then so many minutes of support. So we've seen a huge shift of alignment throughout the district. I have no, no reason to believe that we won't see positive impact from that, uh, uh, that, that work. But that's the basis for building as we go forward to, to provide more training through, the, through link grants, PD, our resource adoption and alignment. All those things are being added in as, as we go. So we will see growth. Um, I think it's going to be incremental. And then once we get to capacity and we, 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 as a staff, have a full understanding of here's what our curriculum is, the alignment, the support structures, we will start to see more significant growth in student outcome. And it won't just be the state assessment because we're looking at behavior, social, emotional, um, obviously math. Uh, so it, it's across the board. I don't know if I answered you directly, but it is broad. It's a, a broad-based approach to make sure we have the structures in place. So I do want to jump in just to kind of summarize. He said it all, but there were a couple key points I thought I could point out. Is in all of our levels we have core instruction, which means grade level standards at that level. But then built into the day is also time for interventions. And so to to directly um, address that is the students are fault. We're following the the curriculum, the tier one protocol at core. 
but during intervention time, the FAST or other pieces will give them the data that they can see, ah, uh, Johnny needs really focus on this skill. And so then during the intervention time, they can target that skill that then will really help with the growth. Where before, we were doing a lot of feels like, or typically it's, you know, struggles at this level, let's support that. So it's a lot more targeted, but they'll get core, and then during the intervention time, that's where we're really going to address a lot of those. Mm -hmm. But if we see that a grade level is missing, um, quite a few of them are missing some foundational skill, then we'll be able to embed that into the core um, instruction as well to try to help, because you don't want to intervene with so many, um, so we can kind of build that in. Okay. So. Now I've got a, a weird question, I guess. Do you have the staff to do what you need to do? I mean, and, and, and I don't, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just talking sheer numbers. I'm not talking, you know, you have the quality of staff, but do you have the staff to do what you need to do? Because that sounds pretty multifaceted to me. <clears throat> I mean, you have grade level and then you have an intervention process, which I thoroughly appreciate the way it was explained by both of you. Yeah, I think when we, we talk about that, there's, there's twofold. How do we scale up the staff that we have, which is right. our PD approach, and the other piece is, is as we add in and we look at efficiencies, um, what would be the additional staff necessary to support this? I think that's a discussion that as a district, as we keep proceeding with this and we will start to uncover and understand what we might need, um, one, for example, is the link staff. I mean, we, we had a three-year grant and we were able to um, hire really 4.5 uh, positions to come in and support us in that. And a lot of that is professional development and then coaching support. That's been a huge bonus for us uh, to be able to have those resources to, to bring them in. And, and we'll go over link here in a second, but without that additional leverage of, of that staff, it's been it's been critical to have, have them involved. So as we go forward, I think we're focusing on um, shoring up our processes, training up our staff, being clear on our focus, removing peripheral distractions that may take us off course. And then as we build this thing, then we will be able to have a better assessment of what staffing we may need. Uh, and, and really and truly, I, as, as a board member, I only speak for myself, I wanna know what you need. I mean, I, I, I wanna know as a board member, because we control the, the purse strings. I mean, I want to know what we need to do to do the best job that we possibly can. And Ramona may have a heart attack because she's got to go find them. Uh -huh. But I mean, um, I, I just, I mean, please, I always ask my direct reports, I want the moon. I want yeah. you to show me what the moon looks like. And then we'll, 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 do, we'll, we'll do what we can do. Right. I think to add on to that too is, you know, if our staff currently are already having to put in more hours and more time, you know, we need to take care of them, A, before to right. me we go and recruit, you know, more people to come in. You know, if they are, I mean, I'm sure they're having to put a lot more time in because they're still teaching and then having to come up with this and dark deals, you know, if there's something that way yeah. we need to take care of that first, I feel like is, if they're putting in a lot more time, we need to make sure we're, Right. And, and that's both of them are great points your point about our staff and the time we put in and we know they only have so many hours in the, in the day if we could add a 25th hour teachers would fill it but we want them to fill their time very focused right. and they're going to work hard i mean our work isn't that their workload is going to be less it's going to be a lot more focused and they'll be mm -hmm. at that table making those decisions and driving a lot of this as they should be and so um if i could squeeze a nickel out of a penny i'll do it but I will also be very upfront and honest as we go through and working with Dr. Dirksen and the board with data that shows over time, if there is any staffing considerations, it will run its course through the cabinet and obviously through Dr. Dirksen. Thank you. So for those students that are excelling um, during intervention time, what, what does that look like for them? Well, the intention of what it needs to look like in a tier two is that they're being stretched from their current level as well. Um, it varies in practice. A lot of times it could be in a center-based practice where they could be on I station at the elementary working independently. We also know that one of our focuses is that we need to have more direct instruction and less independent. You know, there's a time to have a student working individually on a computer-based program, but there's also the fact that the teacher is able to do what teachers do. They can't, computers can't replicate our teachers. And so we're looking at increasing that direct instruction. So stretching all of our kids how we group them. So just being creative in those tier times and using all of our staff. So if we bring in 
let's say for example all of our first grade teachers into a tier two time we take all the first grade students we bring in our instructional paras or special ed staff we divide our kids based on data like fast and then we really send set up very specific smaller groups based on what those kids need at that time and those groups are fluid because that's a good thing about this is every time we go through a screening we know kids are going to grow and so we want to make sure that they're not always in one group or the other that they're in the group they need to be in i'm i'm concerned when i look at the high school numbers the amount of students who need help and if you're in the 12th grade you got a long ways to go in a short time to get there yeah Okay. They're not, they're not the whole grade levels like the other Yeah. Yeah, I thought the same thing. I was yeah. a little bit when I saw that too. I had to count back to make sure exactly what the data should have said. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I feel so much better. <laughs> <laughs> But that's I mean, good data to have if you're sitting in an IEP. Students. Yeah, right. You, it's, but it's data that, that the high school uses in addition to what they're collecting through the IEP document itself. So, so I feel I, I just want to make sure, and we'll continue to update the board that this is a great tool, but it's one tool in our whole tool chest. But it's giving us much more focused um, responses uh, and not guessing. Any other questions on that? Okay. Good. So we don't, we're not going to see the information for non-IEP students for high school? So it would be a grade 10, grade 9 and 10 would be all 9th and 10th grade students. But we don't get the, not 11 and 12 we won't get. Not right. For this year. Not for this right. Year. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, and and there's, a, there's a reason for that. Now, this is a debate that we are, well, not debate, it's a discussion and planning. Um, the state assessment is at 10th grade. And so if we're, and this isn't necessarily test prep because in, in one aspect, it's aligning with our state standards, it's aligning what kids should know by when so that they can perform um, on those testing windows. But we know that juniors and seniors still have need to be stretched and we need to have that information. So the high school, is a, as you guys know, is a whole different beast, just the size of it. And so rolling out like we did with ninth and 10th and then be able to have this bed was a it was a huge task and it was a great start but it's something that as we have further conversations how do we include juniors and or seniors to be able to get this data as well and just for clarity they didn't administer it to 11th and 12th grade so it's not that they have it and they're just not putting it on here they didn't administer yeah, correct. it correct okay. right okay all right Very good thank you okay all right, the next one we're going to lead into, I kind of talked about a little bit, is a, it, the link update and also the flex day update. And I'm going to have Kelly Clark come up here because she truly is um, the expert in this, and I'm so appreciative. I do want to put a plug in because, I, as I said earlier, the, the Striving Readers grant that we received, a little over a million dollars a year, um, we've had the opportunity, and Kelly's going to share, uh, to be able to look at, and I want to commend Tammy and the staff ahead of time, or before, I came in and Kelly came in that set up this grant. Uh, we're a lot of the other school districts in this consortium are calling us about what we're doing and asking what we're doing. And Kelly's going to highlight some of this. And I say that from this standpoint because I'm very proud of the work that we're doing, and that is to transform the focus that literacy uh, is the responsibility of every teacher in the district, regardless of grade level and content area. And our job is to help train them on how to teach those skills at those levels. I, whether it's a, the welding teacher in a CTE classroom or it's that kindergarten teacher doing pre-reading um, skills and instructions with our students. Every one of us has a, has a function and a form in that. And so our LINK grant has, has done tremendous work, not only in the, the reading and the writing, but also looking at ways to engage our community, um, which is an area that we're going to constantly always focus on. Um, as a district because we need to hear from from our parents and know how best to serve them so they can serve their students Also, she's going to talk about the flex day And I know I presented to the board But the flex day just to kind of give you a brief overview is a voluntary option for our teachers To flex their last contract day, which is May 22nd So what we've done and Kelly's staff put in countless hours and put together a very professional in-depth 
um, I feel like very targeted professional development opportunity for our teachers to pick from um, reading modules or reading content area and instructional content area. And what they will do throughout the year is they, there, is, there are activities from researching articles, content, uh, viewing videos, collaborating with peers, developing reflection and documents, um, instructional plans that they will incorporate into their classrooms. And in completion of this throughout the year, um, it, when they complete the full module, then they will not report on the 22nd because they will have completed that time outside the school day. So I want to be clear, flex day means it's not during plan time, it's not during the school day, it's outside the school day. We know that our professionals, they're adults, they're, you know, they're college educated people. Sometimes they learn best at midnight sitting in their comfortable clothes and when everything's quiet and the kids are in bed and their brains are still going. And, and so we want to provide opportunities that learning can occur anytime, anywhere for our adult learners too. I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly and she'll give you, I know in your packet you should have, I think beginning on page 32, um, some of the, the great things that are going on right now. I'm not as tall as you. <laughs> so um, the first thing that's included on your handout has to do with International Literacy Day. Um, what we wanted to do was to uh, provide some culturally responsive texts um, to our, the community. And so we, we invited four uh, community members, Dr. Dirksen being one of them, Martha Mendoza from Beeson being another, um, Ryan Osmus was kind enough to record for us, and so was Maria Farido from Sunflower Bank. And so if you get onto the, the DC Link page um, on the USD 443 site, and we're under the Academics tab, <coughs> Um, you can see those videos being read and families can access them at any time. And our goal is to do more so that families can get on and access um, great books uh, for themselves. Um, then we gave a little update about cohort one and two training. Um, cohort one started last year and so they last year had already received two sessions on culturally responsive teaching. And um, then they had received a session on explicit vocabulary instruction. So coming into this year, we started the year with the literacy aspect. Um, so they started with reading. And cohort two, being that they're coming in for the first time this year, they're starting with those same two sessions on culturally responsive teaching. Um, what we have discovered, <laughs> and it wasn't a terrible surprise, but um, we had to deal with it very quickly, was that there was a substitute issue. Um, and so we, uh, we punted. <laughs> and um, we very quickly uh, tapped into our support from the Language and Literacy Consulting and Southwest Plains Regional Service Center. We transitioned from live sessions for literacy to um, online, kind of a blended model. So the presentations that they were going to do live, they actually did as screencasts with activities that you pause as you're watching the, the learning and do an activity to process. And the instructional coaches are actually facilitating those sessions in the buildings. I'm sending subs to them on a staggered basis so that they can, um, they can get that at a time that's actually more convenient for them because they're the ones, teachers are the ones saying this date and time works for us and then we send the subs to them, but it's not all at the same time. Um, the other nice thing about that has been that we've been able to differentiate that training more than we ever could have done if it had been live. So um, teachers, um, and, and I'm getting reports back from instructional coaches that teachers are actually using that fast data that you were just talking about to determine what avenue, uh, what path will our literacy learning take as we, as we do this professional learning. So there are several sessions uh, or several videos that are overviews of reading and how students learn to read and what happens in the brain as children learn to read. But then it begins to get more targeted. So um, you can go down either word recognition or you can go down language comprehension. And then from there, you can actually dive in even deeper. You can, and if you're in language comprehension, you can choose from background knowledge or language structures. So they can really get targeted with the, the skills that, that 
students need, and part of the way that they're identifying which way to go is through that FAST data. And that's to improve um, that tier one core instruction. So, um, but cohort two, because they were doing that culturally responsive teaching session, uh, because that's um, very interpersonal, we, we decided to keep that live. So those teachers did come to live sessions um, that were either presented with um, Maria Ortiz-Smith from Southwest Plains or Jerry Lovelace from Language and Literacy Consulting. And so they've now completed both sessions of culturally responsive teaching. As we move into second semester, then they'll switch. And um, cohort two will do that vocabulary as part of the literacy side of things. And cohort one will get a third session on culturally responsive teaching so we can continue to go deeper there. Um, one other thing about being able to target so well with um, the cohort one and the literacy is that as teachers make choices about what their kids need, um, they're also selecting instructional strategies. So they learn in the theory behind whatever the skill or is, that's needed is. But then they're presented with some options for instructional strategies. And once they choose that, that's what they build their instructional coaching cycles around. So it goes beyond just getting the learning. They actually begin to implement it, put it into practice with the support of their instructional coach, and oftentimes their colleagues, because many, many teachers are choosing to do their coaching cycles in teams. And so we're seeing some really powerful conversations come out for, with teachers among themselves, and then also with their instructional coaches. So before I move on from that, are there any questions about either of those things that I can answer? <coughs> Okay, so then on the back side, you'll see that um, there are the, there's a little description of the frontline on-demand modules that Dr. Springston mentioned. Uh, those are what are being used for the flex day. So um, we actually identified 11 areas, five of them being literacy-based, reading-based, and six of them being what we're calling general instruction. So your general instruction are things like classroom management and social-emotional learning, that kind of thing. Because we have a lot of teachers who, number one, they're not even in cohort yet. And even when they are, um, their learning about literacy is going to be very different than, say, an ELA teacher you know, who teaches that all day. You know, if, I'm a, if, if I teach um, CTE or whatever, that my needs to help my students act, access the content are very different. So we have to, um, we have to make sure that they have things that are, that are appropriate for them and that will be interesting to them and benefit their students. And as teachers complete those modules on their own time, as Dr. Springston said, completely outside of the school day, um, that time then goes to that May 22nd, May 22nd flex day. Um, and then finally, uh, we, have, we are able to this year, we're really excited about it. My, my team has put together a, what we're calling a conference menu. Um, we've identified some really wonderful um, literacy and also um, multicultural conferences um, throughout the year. And so we're, we've, we're putting a process in place by which teachers can apply to go to a conference. Um, and then there's, a, there's an application review process, and then teachers will be selected accordingly. Now, this semester, um, we've, because the time frame was so short and we have to make travel arrangements, we reached out to principals and we're trying to spread the wealth as much as we can around the district, different buildings, different grade levels, that kind of thing. Um, and they're identifying teachers to go. But next semester, um, actually prior to next semester beginning, we're gonna push out the, the, what the menu is for next semester, what the application process is, so that teachers themselves can identify something that is of interest to them and that they think would be of benefit to their students. They apply. And then, but there is an expectation that if we send you to New Orleans for a concert, for a conference, <laughs> <laughs> for a concert, <laughs> that was a Freudian slip. Sorry. <laughs> but if you go, that there's an expectation that you come back um, and share that information with your colleagues, not just in your building, but across the district in some way, shape, or form. So we're, we're asking them to be thoughtful about how could you possibly do that. Um, not necessarily in person, although that's an option, but uh, there are ways to get information um, back out to the, to the greater good. So that's 
part of what we're doing. I, there's not room for all of it in here, but um, that's this is a big chunk of what we've done for the first couple of months. So, oh, very good. Give them some feedback on what you're hearing from KSDE and then mm -hmm. your invitation. Well, yes, KSDE, um, they're very pleased with our, our grant, with our plan, and um, with the progress that we've made, particularly in the area of instructional coaching. I'm very passionate about that. I am a former instructional coach, and um, so I'm, I'm very passionate about that. But um, I've been invited several times to speak um, to, diff to the different link groups at KSDE. Um, we're actually uh, partnering with KU Center for Research on Learning to do a study of uh, the effectiveness of instructional coaching in 443. I've been invited to attend the KSDE conference and co-present with the ladies from KU and also out to Anaheim um, to, to present to a, the ISTE conference out there this summer. So um, it's really exciting. We, we do get, I get contacted by other districts, in particular in the area of our, of our instructional coaching, but also um, about the family activities that we did over the summer and pop-ups and things. So it's exciting and it's, it's um, really rewarding, so. That's great, good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Absolutely, congratulations. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot of our principals. Thank you, awesome. thank you, Kelly. <laughs> All right, the last item that I have is donation of used textbooks. It's on page 34 of your board packet. Um, September 9th, we brought to the board as a first read, kind of a review and approval of discarding um, instructional materials that weren't in use anymore. And so between that board meeting and the September 23rd, we had a great thing that happened. Uh, somebody in our community watching uh, this board meeting in a tape delay or however it was broadcast uh, saw that and then contacted one of their friends who was a teacher in the district and said there's got to be I know I know a place that takes books so the Union Rescue Mission out of Wichita's name was provided and it got to Barb and then we called and guess what in the chain of events we had it we've we got a great opportunity to take all these mountains of books um, from our buildings and also the storage area next to the Learning Center and get it to an organization that does great mission work and looks to get the books out. Um, they will go through that cycle of finding people. They'll inventory it, get it out to either other countries or, or places in the United States that need these materials. So it's not taking up a landfill. So we feel very good and I think two things. One, that it's not taking up a landfill, but two, that our community is watching and they're helping us um, in, in finding the ways to better our district. So whoever that was, if they're watching, thank you. Uh, we don't, I, I did not like the idea of, of putting stuff in the landfill, but um, this group came out with several men, several trailers, two days, and they worked their tails off and, and got all everything um, taken out. And they do want to come back in the spring and summer when we have our ELA materials, when we get new materials, they'll take all of what we currently have. So we're very excited about having them as a partner. It's great for this instance, but it's also something that can be used in the future as well. Yep. It's great. Yep. Since I was so vocal about wanting to find some place for that, I would like to thank whoever was listening personally as well, because I, it just makes you feel better to know that those books are going to be used yep. properly. Yep. <laughs> thank yep. you. Thank you for your work. Yeah, I, I am familiar with the Union Rescue Mission, and they do great work. Mm -hmm. Great. They actually do great work. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Springs. Next up, we've got the Head Start Program Board of Education Governing Board Training. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I hope you brought your comfy clothes because we'll be here for a couple of hours. <laughs> now, it's um, last year when um, AC shared the training, you guys, some of you are new board members, some of you had been on the board before. And so he shared the video links and you watched the different videos and just kind of give you some general information about the different areas of the Head Start program. And so the link is on your board agenda as well. This year, because you are not new board members, you've already gone through that formal training, we just wanted to bring it back to your attention <laughs> You know that you can go to that site and click in and, and watch some things if there was a certain area that you needed a little bit of a refresher on. I know that uh, Tracy and Ryan has served directly on the board 
um, or the, the policy council, and they can always ask and answer questions for you. And of course, AC and I can, can help with things as well. The biggest thing that Head Start really wants the, the school board to understand is that you are the governing board. And so we have the policy council that will approve or give input, and then the school board does the same thing. And you do that by approving staff members, reviewing bills, approving, um, or at least receiving like the information memorandums, policy information, those types of things. Um, and then of course we'll also share things and we can review if there's uh, information that needs to come your way. And so we will um, use this time as our official board training for Head Start. But like I said, you're welcome to go back and review the videos, ask any questions that you have. And once you feel that you're pretty comfortable and, and understand that role, then we will have you sign off on a, on a document just to say that um, you have been refreshed and reminded um, of the expectations that the school board has over the Head Start program. So do you guys have any specific questions that I can help with? Thing. Guys, that didn't take hours then, did it? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Tammy. All right. Uh, next up, we have Public Information Office, Carrie Baker. Good evening, Madam Chair, board members, Dr. Dirksen. I'm bringing forward this evening just information and for discussion only, and it's the naming of our new building. So it's exciting because as we look forward to what we're going to put up on signs, how we're going to communicate the building, um, we've tossed around several different names in cabinet, but we landed on one, and that is the District Office and Learning Center. So we're looking for your feedback. We want you to think about that. Um, discuss it. If you have other suggestions, send them my way. But then I think we'll go through an approval process at a later time. Any questions? Any off-the-cuff ideas? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. They're usually the best. <laughs> I like this one. What can we shorten that down to, though? I mean, you know, this That's the D-O-L-C. <laughs> <laughs> She's already got an answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thought of everything. <laughs> That's cool. Pretty brief. <laughs> I, I just don't think it sounds important enough. This is this is a really important building. It's the it's the hub. It's the center of this wonderful school district, and I think it needs a really profound kind of name. I think that uh, one of the reasons we're open we to suggestions, Pamela. No, That's exactly right. <laughs> Learning closed. center because we want to obviously transfer that because we've had several questions. Is the learning center going to stay? What's happening with the learning center? We felt like that was a really good piece to include that in the name. Uh, too, so. I'm thinking about people who come in from out of town and they read the name of the building and they say this, the district, district office and learning center, oh, what, what is that? Is that learning what kids learn there? What, and district office, where's superintendent's office? And, mm. you know, sometimes people who aren't in the school district and don't know the lingo <clears throat> kind of use a different language, so. I'm not sure. I guess I feel like district office does, I mean, when I think district office, I do think the administration and... and to be clear, uh, Dodge City Public Schools will be the headliner of the yes. name. So um, it won't be just district office. So and it will be Dodge City Public Schools, district office learning center. Then if we have other vendors that join as well, then their names below on the on the oh, signage so well, on the that. official it's signage. Specifically, but the this one is we're the thinking. name of the building. Yes, the, specifically the vendor is what Carrie calls it is a the uh, special ed six one three cooperative. Okay, you didn't have Dodge City Public Schools. Dodge yes, City Public Schools is going to be yeah. very large. That's so why we went through that little say. refresh with the yeah. with the logo piece, and that will be a crowning yeah. crowning piece. And then district office and learning district center. District office learning center. I thought okay. well, that's just not Great. enough. No, <laughs> that, that you painted a good picture. That was nice. <laughs> I think that'll be nice. Anybody? Fly Any other questions? If not, that's all I had to bring forward this evening. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks, Carrie. I like the holding pattern we've got going here. Yeah, we've got <laughs> <laughs> to move it in and out. We like that. I like that anyway. Came from Cargill. <laughs> Good evening. I'm here on behalf of Bright Beginnings today to make a staffing request, which is a little out of our normal time frame. But the Kansas state law states that if you have daycare in more than one location, you must have a supervisor available in both locations. And right now we've been utilizing Kathy 
Gamelik to kind of run the whole thing, and she's fully capable of doing that. But the regulation says, no, there must be a person designated as supervisor in this um, secondary location. So what we're doing is taking a person that we have already been using in that capacity some and moving them up the pay scale a little bit and giving them a new job description that reflects those supervisory responsibilities in order to meet the state mandate. So it's really a compliance issue um, that we're bringing this forward today and the funding is all through the Bright Beginnings Fund so it's not district funds utilizing this. So. Basically, we're just trying to keep everyone happy and everything moving along as it should. And this would start immediately? Immediately, yes. Okay. okay. I move Thank for you. approval. I second. Motion by Ryan and a second by Tammy. All in favor? 7-0. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Business services. Mr. Russell. Good evening. Like uh, Carrie kind of alluded to just a little while ago, here in a few months, we'll be moving out of this building, which will mean this building will be empty. So uh, I, I think back in June, you guys did an RFP, um, put out some public information on the building. Uh, since that time, there has been no inquiries made. Uh, so we thought it would be prudent to go ahead and list this building for sale. Uh, so that's what I'm here tonight for, is to ask your permission to list that with Brian Delzig uh, for $200,000. Did want to put some caveats in there to make sure that if the building does sell, that it's, it's used, it doesn't just sit empty. So part of that, it felt like it was prudent to go ahead and disclose uh, what previous inspections have found, some of the defects and things that will need to be taken care of. And then um, ask that the uh, potential buyer uh, provide a, um, an, an engineering study that will fix those deficiencies and then provide some kind of um, fiscal proof of capability to finance that as well. So, I mean, we'd like to sell it uh, and, and find a good home for it, so to speak, but we want to make sure that it doesn't just sit vacant. So we added those uh, two pieces to that. And so that's what I'm here to ask you for tonight. So Hammer, if we uh, list this and have no takers, kind of walk through what our next. Well, then there's a couple different option, options. You can go ahead and put it up for public auction. Um, I'm not sure that's a great idea, but that is an auction. We can vacate it and uh, um, uh, de demolish the building instead of leaving it empty and find a use for it after that. Uh, I did go ahead and, and ask for some estimates on that. Haven't received them, haven't made any kind of commitments, but just for the sake of keeping things moving, since we, we are just a few months away from leaving this building, wanted to have some contingencies there for you. Uh, we, we did want to list it for through the end of January, to give a few months uh, for somebody. He's also uh, recommended that we list it on a website called LoopNet, which is um, I believe it's the number one commercial uh, real estate website that there is. So making a very good concerted effort to actually sell the building. How, I'm interested in the price that he, Mr. Delsight put on it, 200000 That is a great question. <laughs> um, I wish I had a great answer. Oh, okay. Um, I don't, <laughs> but there's no real comps. So it, it was a topic of discussion and um, I believe this is on the tax rolls for 2.1 million, but I looked at some of the inspections that were done, and some of them were done in 2008, some in 2016, and there's probably several million dollars worth of repairs that will need to be done here. Not all of them were itemized, and all of them were fairly outdated that I saw. So there's a substantial amount of money that it would take you know, to get this operational again. So didn't want to list it too high. Um, the 200 was just kind of the best guess gut feel. Obviously, um, you know, that can that can be taken into account and, and we can take another offer. But there, there was nothing solid or tangible to base that on other than kind of what's happened to other real estate around here um, and what it was going to take 
to keep this thing going. He didn't say building, you know, was worth this much and the land it sits on was worth X amount. He didn't. Um, did not look at any hard numbers. I just wondered. <coughs> Can I ask why is there a contingency if somebody buys the land that it has to stand or they have to repair it? I guess if someone came to, is, I'm just making sure I'm understanding. It doesn't have to be. No, well, they, I'm just making sure I understand that right because I don't, I, I mean, if I buy the property or the land, usually there's not a contingency because if we're looking forward that maybe we're going to have to tear it down and stuff, 200000 is better to get in our pocket versus what they're going to do with the, I guess that would just be my if I'm making sense, the 200000 if, if I understand you correctly, I, I think we just feel like we have a responsibility to the community to make sure that its purpose is worthy of us leaving. And uh, we just want to make sure that we're being good stewards. So uh, I think, and I might be wrong, but I think if somebody uh, wanted to purchase this for 200000 and and were clear in their instructions that they were going to tear it down, that would be a win-win for just us. That, they, that we have to be clear about what they're doing. Yes. That they don't have yes. to come in. I thought they said something about it. they have to come in well, and repair it. Well, we're assuming someone is, going, someone is going to buy it for a purpose of refurbishing or whatever, and we want to make sure that they have the wherewithal for that to happen because – there are extensive needs to this building. Yeah, I think the city gave us a little nudge in that direction because we've got some large buildings that are sitting and been sitting for almost decades now. Yeah. So they don't want another one. And so I think that's the reasoning behind the thought process. Mm -hmm. But all unreasonable offers will be looked at too. Yeah. So I think that's what it's doing. Any other questions on this? Okay. I would make a motion um, that we uh, list this building according to the contract that's been proposed. Okay. Second. Motion by Jeff and a second by Ryan. All in favor? 7 0. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Dr. Dirksen. Okay. I bring before you a proposal to continue our membership with Schools for Fair Funding. We've had uh, several discussions in the past several months involving um, this item. Uh, to my surprise, they did clearly change their role, which I believe fits within what we were asking for and wanted to make sure you were aware of that. But more uh, away from a litigation mode, the two clear goals for this year are to monitor school finance issues to assure full implementation of the Gannon reforms that have been worked on very hard over the years, and we were one of the founding school districts of that purpose. And the second goal is to preserve the adequacy and equity of the school finance formula. Both of those goals, I not only uh, can live with, but I also want to encourage that we continue to support. The good news is there was a dramatic uh, decrease in assessments from five and a quarter per student to a dollar ten per student, which drops our uh, assessment this year to seven thousand five hundred and sixty-four dollars and forty-eight cents. Um, I believe we have carried the torch for many years. I tried to provide some enclosures for you that showed mm -hmm. the membership. Um, at one time, there were as many as 72 school districts involved. I think currently there are 40. There's also a very interesting page of, uh, on page 48 that shows our participation in dollars, and we've uh, paid a significant amount of dollars. But the return from the litigation that has been accomplished and the gains for student needs um, far outweighs what we've put in. Mm -hmm. And it's worth pointing out that because this district was bold enough to take steps that uh, moved us forward, every school district in the state benefited from this. And so we truly were um, among the leaders in education for public schools, something to be proud of. And I would ask that we continue membership this year. 
I know we talked earlier about if their direction didn't change, it may be time for us to reconsider our membership. I'm happy to report as I outlined in the goals that the direction has changed and I feel like we can live with that and have a responsibility to do so. I agree I, and I feel like the, the cost is at a rate that's reasonable for us to continue. We're going to have good leadership. So. Mm -hmm. Were any of the, you're nice, Dr. Dirksen, were any of the original schools that were part of the litigation, are they no longer? No, uh, the four original schools oh, the four, are okay. Hutchison, they're all still Wichita, and us. Kansas City, okay. along with Dodge City. Yes. I'll make a motion for approval. Okay. I'll second that. Motion by Tracy and a second by Pamela. All in favor? 7 0. Thank you. All right, Board of Education Member District Responsibilities, Park and Rec Advisory Board. Tracy, has there been a meeting or um, information? I literally have been out of town for more than 30 days. Yes. Other than <laughs> to come back for our meeting. To so. do your laundry and yeah. go to a meeting. <laughs> I was out of town too. <laughs> so we're in your help. Okay. So we will assume if no news is good news, I guess. <laughs> All right, um, Bright Beginnings Head Start, Ryan. Yeah, we have a meeting uh, tomorrow, uh, you know, lunch hour. Uh, we did meet, had our first meeting last month. Uh, very nice uh, turnout, selected uh, officers, got updates on everything related from uh, professional development to enrollment numbers to uh, curriculum. So it was uh, very, very positive. They're doing an excellent job moving forward. I think Head Start and Early Head Start are both full time um so yeah things are going great. well things are going great very good thank you, you. To add, Tammy? No, I think so. okay that's great thanks ryan all right special education special education tomorrow is a pretty big day because we're having our our uh monthly meeting here in dodge city at nine o'clock they'll the board and superintendents will do a tour of the new administration building and see the space where they're going to be located We'll have our regular meeting here. Doug Meckel will be here from KASB and we'll begin, officially begin the new director search. I, after our last meeting, I just realized that uh, this year, before the 1st of July, we will select a new director. We will move locations. And I found that that over half my board is not running for reelection. <laughs> And in many of the ones that have, are the faithful attenders and participants. So we've got, a, it's going to be a heck of a year. Um, uh, we've also got some internal things that we still need to work through. Um, I'm trying to spend about a day or a half a day there a week. Um, just going through things and talking with the staff. Um, we're trying to understand, I've got great input from our people uh, in 443 about staffing, uh, especially the administrative staff. Um, and I, I can't talk about it here because I haven't talked to my board, the 613 board yet, but I want to make sure, but uh, I think we have some monumental decisions to make uh, as we choose a new director and uh, then move locations. It's going to be a tour, but it's going to be a phenomenal opportunity. And I'm looking forward to it because, um, you know, I think we can make something that's good much better. And uh, so uh, I would, as always, your input, uh, you know, suggestions, complaints, uh, good news, bad news, I want to hear it um, because we are. Um, embarking on some really it's uh, as i see it it is we are going to change we're, we're going to create a new normal a new um, way of doing business uh, so um, I, that's 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 where we're headed and uh, i want to thank our administrative staff here because i've talked with you know, several people in, in and i get great input uh, from our staff and so um, that's kind of my long report but uh, tomorrow I think it's a big day 
because I want to get the board members and the superintendents excited about the future. And I think when they see the building, I think I think that can happen. So anyway, any questions? Yeah. Thank you for all the time you're putting well, on it's, this. I got it. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, capital outlay. Tracy and Tammy, do you? Well, uh, before that, may I jump back up to legislative? Oh, yes. Sorry. Um, one thing I do want everybody concerned about is something called high density weighting. And in the current school finance formula, high density weighting had a clause in it that it is to sunset at the end of last year. And so we're actually waiting on the legislative session to take place to reinstate high density weighting. I believe the number that I quote is 2.8 million for um, USD 443. And so it's a significant number. It totals 54 million in the state. Most districts get some money from high density weighting, but many in our category with the weightings that we have get a significant amount of money. And what we're very worried about is the legislature will capture 54 million and decide to use it elsewhere. And we're trying to use it for many of the programs that we talked about tonight. So uh, <coughs> as far as legislative uh, outlook, I think high density weighting is something that you could visit with if you run into one of our legislators that we're definitely concerned about that. So I wanted to make sure that topic um, I think I've mentioned it earlier, but I want to make sure it stays on the forefront with us. And then on capital outlay, I uh, want to report uh, that there is work going on. Um, as we look at uh, the 1.1 million I talked about that we we're setting aside out of capital outlay for Memorial Stadium, I would share with you that we did have a meeting last month. I, I talked about it in the Week in Review, and we are uh, working on that project. So we're already taking money out of it. Um, Chris Meyer has presented a, a list uh, to Hammer of things that we know we're going to have to do that come before the meeting, if you will. And then we are taking with a new business director, we're taking a conservative, cautious approach to what we're doing. As we Thursday, Hammer and I go to Topeka to meet with Dale Dennis, one of the first questions we have on the list is, some outline uh, discretion on capital outlay. I want Hammer to hear it from the State Department themselves. And so we're formulating what our committee is going to look like. And I anticipate the number is going to be small this year. I just want you to know that ahead of time. But we're taking care of many things that we need to be taking care of before we get to that committee. And uh, so that is definitely on our minds. It's definitely on the forefront and we're making progress on it. I want you to know that. Anything on that? Okay. Thank you. Um, calendar committee, I don't believe you've met. No. no. Okay. Uh, for next uh, November meeting, Tammy, we've got you down to review bills. Um, I believe we're ready for announcements. Um, tomorrow is the tour uh, with um, the special ed co-op of the new facility. Um, October 28th is Board of Education luncheon meeting at Ross at noon. November 6th is American Education Week and uh, USD 443 Family Event Night at the Civic Center at 5 o'clock. Uh, November 11th, Board of Education meeting here in the Austin Boardroom at 6 o'clock. November 25th is our luncheon meeting at Sunnyside at noon. Um, December 6th through the 8th is the 2019 KASB Annual Conference and Delegate Assembly in Wichita. Um, who is there? Does anybody know? Are they going? Or we need to decide probably next meeting, I would guess. Or do we need to Let's decide? Say we can review. I think we, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's right. We, we need a, like uh, November 1st. We need a delegate um, that will represent us at the, at the uh, Delegate Assembly. In December, I'll check. I think I can go, but I went last year, so I don't want to. That's okay, Deb. That's yeah, okay. Pamela and I went. Pamela last year. I'd be interested. Okay. So, can I ask you to contact uh, Deborah to make sure that we get that? Uh, we, it, w it sounds like we already have two that are interested in Ryan, going. I think we are. Uh, Ryan, too. Well, yeah. I will have a legislative committee meeting there, but I have to look at my calendar because I'm. Uh, yeah, I don't okay. know. I'll get. Okay. Back to ASAP. 
That would be great. We do have three rooms already blocked. And if we didn't have three volunteers, we needed to cancel out of one of those. And I think November 1st was the deadline. So. If you give me the if, times and stuff, yeah, one of them we're there for a Christmas yeah. party already. So in Wichita, so oh, if I can, well, if it fits in before all of them. Yeah, we'll come and go to the party. Yeah, then you guys can come to the party. party. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a good combination. We're just oh, boy. <laughs> is, is there one that one of you that would um, like to volunteer to be the delegate for us? Um, if. I, I did it last year. I have no. I would be happy to do it again um, if I'm able to attend. Okay. So, I I think you would be a good choice because they're because voting on what comes out of the committee. Right. Mm -hmm. Since I'm on the committee. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I'll let you know if I can attend. Okay. Possible. All right. Okay. Make sure. Okay. All right. Do we have items for future board meetings or additional information? Anybody? One thing that I forgot to share was the fact that. I am the 613 representative on the service center <laughs> board. And so that means we have two members, <laughs> two of our board members, and Tammy's our, our, our board member. So that was an interesting conversation to have, but I couldn't get a volunteer, you know, you know, from 613. So I just wanted to make that known that Excellent. I go to a lot of meetings now. <clears throat> Okay, if we have no other items, uh, we're ready for executive session as authorized by Kansas Law 754319 for discussion on an organization requesting the district's involvement with their purpose pursuant to the exception for data relating to trade secrets of a business. Um, we need how long? I need um, school council and the business director and myself, and I believe we need 10 minutes of time. Okay. Just one, one thing, if you didn't see the halftime, I mean, the football team 6-0, and that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. But the band at halftime was spectacular. Mm -hmm. David, 3 a.m. Saturday morning to go to KDA. <laughs> I'll pray for you. Is that, but I mean, they were spectacular. I, I just. It was good. Is that in Topeka, Jackie? Jackie? Is that where you guys, okay. We perform at 10 a.m. 10 a.m., okay. Well, they, but anyway, they were marvelous. All right. Does anybody need my jacket? Uh, yeah. I can't your Would you like to make a motion? <laughs> yes. I'll make a motion no mercy for, for executive session for 10 minutes. Anybody second? Anybody second? Second. second. Yeah. Second. Motion by Tammy, second by Ryan. All in favor? Seven. Good night, all. Thank you, everyone.